Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. When did certain alarms go off out there that said mortgage crisis ahead? More, the, the alarm started actually going off well before the foreclosure crisis started. What we started to see were kinds of loan products being sold, particularly to subprime customers, but even customers who should have gotten prime loans, but who were in subprime. And these were loans that were clearly designed that there would be no ability to repay these loans and that the only way you could deal with them was either to refinance, sell the house, or go into foreclosure. And we knew that once the refi option and the sale option went away, a lot of these folks were going to the foreclosure, and that's when we started raising alarms about the practices going on in the market. In your opinion, why would anyone issue a loan to someone they knew couldn't pay it? It was a change in the delivery system, a pretty dramatic change over the last 10 to 15 years, where 15, 20 years ago, you used to go down to your corner bank, you'd get your loan from someone who knew you, and that bank would hold on to the loan until you repay that loan. So the bank had a vested interest in making sure that you were a good customer, but also making sure that you could afford to repay it. In the intervening years, mortgage brokers became a much bigger part of the, of the puzzle. And in fact, by 2004, 75% of the loans across the country were being made through mortgage brokers. Now, mortgage brokers basically sell that loan down the line. They sell it off to investors. That loan is then packaged with other loans, sliced and diced, and sold as securities. So your home loan could be owned by you know, investors across the country and pension funds, but also by investors in Dubai and China and all across the world. It made a lot of mortgage finance available. But what it did was that suddenly the people who were selling you the mortgage had no interest in making sure that the loan could be repaid. They just needed to get the loan made. And if they could make a loan that forced you to refinance after a couple of years, even better, because there were more fees to be made. How much of this with the foreclosures, with the housing crisis, how much of that responsibility fell on mortgage brokers and mortgage underwriters? I think the fact is, is that a lot of the products that were being sold were irresponsible products, and they were very complicated, and most folks had no idea what it was they were really getting into. Now, granted, there, are, there is some personal responsibility that, that, you know, there's blame to go on both sides. But the fact is, is that mortgage lenders, mortgage brokers, mortgage companies, and even uh, finance companies, they knew that this was a very complicated marketplace. And they used that complicated nature to try to get people to think that the loan was different than what it was. And because the person who sat down across the table from the mortgage broker, who put themselves out as a trusted intermediary in the mortgage market, trusted that person to get them the best loan for them. And unfortunately, that was a mistake. How much specific responsibility fell to the borrower, to the, how, to the home buyer? I think anybody who has sat in a closing, at a, at, a, at, a, at a real estate closing, knows that stack of paperwork is gigantic. Most people, even if they do read all the documents, they're incredibly difficult to understand, let alone then when you have somebody who's sitting across the table from you who is telling you, no, it looks like that, but it's not, or trying to sell you on the fact that this is a good loan for you. Folks went into the system trusting the system. It's very complicated. And I think even though we can sit and try to blame the borrower, the fact is, is that the lenders knew that this was an inappropriate loan, and they should have really been the one to step in and say, wait a second, this isn't right. We need to stop doing this. What role did government policy, federal government policy, play in the creation of these sorts of mortgages you said were unsustainable? Very little. Actually, most of the, 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 the kinds of loans that we saw that led to the initial part of this crisis uh, were loans that were sold through Wall Street. This was actually a very unregulated marketplace. Mortgage brokers were regulated on the state level. Some states like North Carolina did a terrific job of regulating brokers. Other states didn't. But Wall Street, you know, was providing the funding for these mortgages. They were actually setting the terms for these mortgages. There was nobody really looking over the shoulder of Wall Street banks and saying, wait a second, you know, this isn't, this isn't a good product. The Federal Reserve had the ability to write rules to wipe all of this out and could have. And in fact, received several warnings that they could have dealt with this, and they chose not to. So we really see this as a fail of failure of regulation, but it's a failure of not enough regulation, not government pushing these kinds of loans out into the marketplace. But leading politicians in this country were out there publicly saying everyone should have a shot at owning a home, which mm -hmm. is the American dream. Sure. And, and people who support these loans, however risky they're deemed to be, they'll say it was because of these loans people got that opportunity. Is that, a, is that a accurate assessment? It's really, actually it's not. That's what's funny is it is accurate that we've pushed home ownership in the country. And I think that that's a reasonable policy that, you know, home ownership provides stability, it provides an opportunity to create wealth. Not every person's ready for home ownership, but certainly it should be made more widely available. 
but on fair terms. And that was where it really fell apart. The mortgages that were being offered were completely unfair, and they were so um, opaque that most people just could not figure out what was going on in their loan until it was too late. Um, the fact is, is that you know, lenders were taking advantage of the fact that there were people that were trying to get into homes. Um, but also, th the big thing is that in the subprime marketplace, anywhere from, depending on the year, 50 to 75 percent of the loans being made were not purchase money. They weren't made to buy the, loan, the house. They were refinances. So they were going into people who already had probably good loans, convincing them to refinance their credit card debt or their car debt into their house, and that's when you'd start to see the spiral. So this really wasn't a home ownership drive. What people were doing was taking advantage of that, wrapping themselves around with the American flag and selling things that they knew were really toxic for homeowners. As we enter the second decade of the 2000s, um, where do you see the trend going? Unfortunately, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Even in North Carolina, we're on pace for record numbers of foreclosure filings again this year. Uh, we're expecting that it'll be over 70,000 foreclosure filings. Um, we've already seen that uh, hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians have lost their homes. What we're hopeful of is that there are a number of programs that are coming out that are going to try to help people stop from losing their home in foreclosure, whether it's the Commissioner of Banks program that helps to intervene during a foreclosure or programs that, with federal money, will actually provide assistance to people who are unemployed to help make their mortgage payment while they get back on their feet. We think, you know, we've thought all along that we needed to be aggressive to try to stem the tide of foreclosures, not only for the people who are losing their homes, but for the stability of neighborhoods. The average North Carolinian who lives a quarter mile from a foreclosed house has seen their house depreciate by up to $2,500. If you live with a lot of foreclosures, you're, you're, you're taking a beating even though you did everything right. So we need to be as aggressive as possible still. From the perspective of the Center for Responsible Lending, are programs like those, such as loan modifications or loan forgiveness, in some case, principal forgiveness, are these best temporary programs in our economic climate, or, or should they be a permanent feature of our government? It may not necessarily be part of government, but we certainly think that, they sh that even when the foreclosure crisis abates, that there are still foreclosures that happen that don't need to happen. What we hope is, is that at least some of what we've learned from this Folks will take a look at it and figure out ways to try to help people save their homes from foreclosure even when we're not facing 70000 a year. Um, the fact is, is we know that even every foreclosure creates instability in a, in a neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, we should make resources available to people who uh, may have gotten into a bad loan or may have been sold a bad loan or may have just found themselves in a bad situation. Uh, we're better off if that person can stay in that community, stay in that house, um, rather than being displaced and through foreclosure. Should a person expect if they, if they get assistance with their mortgage that they're going to be forgiven from making a house payment? No, I think uh, most of these programs that are out there where there's a loan modification, it modifies the terms of the loan, particularly in loans that are just, you know, where the interest rate is way higher than it needed to be, or the terms of the loan were set up where the person was destined to fail. We need to restructure those loans and make them fair. These are still people who are going to pay their mortgage. And the fact is, is that most everybody who's got a mortgage generally wants to pay it. Now, there are always going to be folks for whom you know, the foreclosure is the only option. We realize that, that there's just nothing you can do to help those folks. There are a lot of people who just need a little bit of help to get back on their feet. They live in a high unemployment county or, you know, they were sold a loan that just was terrible. Uh, you know, we're better off giving that person a better start. We're not wiping the loan off the books, but at least making it easier for them to succeed. What do you say to the guy who sold the new car and he drives the old beat up pickup, he's cut off the cable television, turned off his cell phones, but he's made his payment and he doesn't have a very good loan. Mm -hmm. But he's seeing his neighbor keep the car, keep the house, and get a loan modification. You know, we, we hear that story a lot. I think, you know, most of the people who are getting loan modifications, they're, they're, they've done everything they need to do. I mean, most of these folks, they're not hanging on to a lot of assets. They have run themselves down to where they have no choice left. So I think in the majority of people we talk to who are seeking modifications, it's not so that they can shield other assets. It's because that's, this, is, this is as far as they can get. But to that person who lives next door to someone who did get a modification, the fact is, is if that house goes in foreclosure, you lose your home equity. And so even though you may not, you know, you may not love the person who lives next door to you. You're better off if that person's in that house making payments, taking care of the house, than having a vacant house next door that's not being taken care of and that's driving down the cost of your, that's driving down the value of your home. We need to, st what we need to do is really stabilize our neighborhoods, get our economy back on our feet. Then we can start talking about 
you know, next steps. But right now, we've got a lot of work to do, and we need, we need some aggressive action still. When will the state of North Carolina cross this threshold where the experts can say we're no longer in a foreclosure or a mortgage crisis? When foreclosures start to slow down, I mean, I think ultimately what we need to, you know, when, when we don't have, you know, record numbers of foreclosures and we're not seeing people struggle so much to try to, to, try to keep their heads above water, um, when we're not seeing neighborhoods where, you know, half the houses are either in the final stages of foreclosure or have foreclosure filings, I think then we'll know we're not in a, in a foreclosure crisis. But if you allow these houses to foreclose all at the same time, eventually won't someone buy them and try to fix them up and live, them, live in them? Or is that, is that inaccurate or, or, or whimsical for a neighborhood? You know, it, you'd, you'd like to think that, but the change, it also changes the complexion of the neighborhood. I mean, take, for example, if you have a neighborhood that is, you know, 95% owner occupied, if half the houses go into foreclosure, bought up by investors and then turn them into rental properties. Nothing, not to say that rental property is not a bad, you know, not a good thing, but the neighbor, the, 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 the neighborhood changes. But it's going to take a long time for that to happen. It's going to take a long time for investors to come in. In the meantime, they're getting bargain ba basement prices. So for that other half of the people who still live in the neighborhood, their house that might have been worth $150,000 is now worth $90,000. Well, if they have a $120,000 mortgage on that property, that now they're underwater. So you've taken that other half, and you might have, you know, cleared the decks there. Now you've put an incredible amount of stress on that other half of the, of the neighborhood. That doesn't help anybody. Um, that other half of the neighborhood, they're now losing their equity, and they may be at risk of foreclosure. You could actually put the whole neighborhood under. So the best strategy is, is when you've got something like this is to go in and try to find ways. If you can avoid that foreclosure, and if it's avoidable in a reasonable way, then, then we should do everything we can to try to keep people in their houses rather than letting a, a number of houses in the neighborhood just go vacant.